morning, everyone. Um, I have to echo the uh, feeling that every year there's more and more people that come to these uh, TED events, and it's really very inspiring to see uh, everyone who's interested in learning not just about some of the others who may be studying, but uh, also learning about the, the ways that translates into the industry side, um, where you may go work afterwards. That actually got me thinking as to what do Imperial College graduates do when they're done with their degree. So I had a look at the numbers. If you haven't, I highly suggest you go have a look. It's very interesting. We're a science, engineering, and medicine university. So unsurprisingly, about 35% go into medicine. Then there's about 10% that go into a startup or a tech. There's only about 10% that go into industry, in the old sense of the, of the term, technical companies, engineering companies. And then there's 40%, and I think you know where I'm going with this, there's 40% that go into a consultancy or a financial institution. Now couple that with the fact that according to the World Economic Forum, about 69% of people under 25 change jobs every 12 months. There's a feeling of complete mobility that is very new to the sector, and even companies are having a hard time um, knowing how to deal with it. If you go and ask an HR department today at what the field looks like, They'll tell you, well, we have lots of positions we need to fill, either for graduate entry or for a little bit later in the career, but we can't find the people. And despite the fact that there's all this mobility and there's more and more students and more and more universities. Um, but if you ask the students and the young engineers, well, there's a little bit of frustration because the process isn't simpler. It's always as competitive and as difficult. And even for people in their industry, they don't really feel like they're doing what they were pitched to do when they joined the company. Usually, if you go to a careers event, you'll get a pitch on the great projects that they do, the great construction or the great industries and the challenges that you will face. And then you get into the program and you're in a nice streamlined environment that you don't actually get to do anything outside of. Um, that creates a sense of frustration for a lot of the young people in companies. Usually they'll propose something like a graduate program that's four years gone and then you'll, follow, you'll choose one of them and then you go down that path. The problem is that students nowadays are much more collaborative minded and they want a more well-rounded approach and that's not something that they see themselves do. And this leads to the mobility. I've seen this in my career as well. Um, I started working in construction on a cable stay bridge in the US, hired about 15 young engineers. Um, there's only two left, I'm one of them, and I'm the only one in that geography. Um, this is also an issue for the people who stay in the companies because there's a phenomenon that I keep observing with people who are later in their career, which I call technical nostalgia. It's the, uh, the process by which people are so streamlined in following the company process and the, the company procedure way of thinking that as soon as something a little bit strange and a little bit technical that relates to that problem-solving mindset that you have when you start out and it comes along, they nerd out completely about it and they waste all their time trying to figure that small little thing. I, that for me is emblematic of what I would call technical nostalgia. So, wondering why do we observe this in, uh, in the professional sector? What is it about companies that means that has made them so rigid? Well, if you think about industry in the, in the old sense of the term, and when I refer to industry, it's more technical companies and then engineering companies. Um, they have historically been the main drivers of societal innovation. About 100 years ago, they would bring along the great changes, and they were very synonymous with developments of entire nations. But as time has gone along, there were more and more companies and more and more competitive environments with larger and larger projects. So companies settled on business models that um, worked for them. And then their focus became less on about innovating at a society level and more about sustaining and making that business model survive. And so when you have that need to sustain the business model, you create procedures around it. You create means to format newcomers into the company to feed that model. And you get an obsession with collecting data to understand how your model works. So there's an explosion of things like quality audits and ISO certifications. And there are entire departments in engineering companies and technical companies dedicated to understanding how that model works. But obviously, that's not really an inspirational thing for young graduates to come and choose to join. Um, that, therefore, means that everything that isn't necessarily that important to sustain the model is, is put on the back burner. So things like long-term thinking, long-term innovation, is slightly less important. And uh, the concept by which you would train people to maybe have more, more interesting careers, uh, more well-rounded personalities, is also uh, a little bit less important. This, I think, resembles a, uh, a much more finance-oriented way of thinking. Now, the financial sector has had more and more importance in, in everyday life in, in, in recent decades. 
and they are motivated by very different um, mindsets. They focus more on short-term profit, on risk that they can understand, and on things that they've seen before, they have a past experience or a past class on it, and that's when they choose to follow you more. And since uh, these companies have now focused more on their business models, the two are feeding each other quite well, but what's losing out on it is the long-term aspect and the long-term innovation um, throughout society itself. Now, at this point, I do have to mention that clients are, are quite complicit in this as well. By clients, I mean it's usually a, a public sector client that has a very big project that they want to undertake, and, uh, and therefore they ask the world experts in that field. Um, previously, uh, they, these public entities had their own technical departments, and they had their own technical knowledge, and they would foster that kind of knowledge. But with the sheer size of projects, major projects are usually in the billions of them all, um, and the amount of projects coming up more and more of them at the same time, it didn't become sustainable to sustain entire technology, uh, technical departments. And so they relied more on the private sector. Add to that the fact that public sector usually works on a short-term election cycle, and you realize that technical departments in the public sector are going away. That brings more reliance on the private sector, meaning more reliance just means you put the risk on them. And that created some contract structures that feed this kind of thinking. First, it was design-build contracts, so where you, you don't just ask them to make the product and build it, you ask them to design it as well. And now we're up into the P3 level, the public-private partnership, where you even put the funding and the conception of the project onto the private sector as well, taking away that. And obviously, the private sector has all this new risk that they need to manage as well. And so they go back to their core model because they, they know that works. And that, again, stifles uh, the innovation and the drive and the pluridisciplinarity of the engineering mindset, which is, or which was, the reason for existing. And so, where there's a, a vacuum, sort of a brain drain of, of engineers and young graduates like yourselves, usually there are players that come in and fill the gap. And there's three main players that are filling the gap today. The first one is startups. Now, startups originally came as sort of the perfect solution, because the idea is, there's a problem out there, no one seems to be tackling it, I will come up with a solution and fix the problem. Innovation in the, old sense, uh, in, in the old sense of the term when it comes to startups really was about creating a company and then seeing it through to the end, making that your core career. But what startups have become today is, is a little bit different. They've become uh, a process by which you identify a problem that you think you can solve, you very quickly produce a product that solves it and that you can get to market. The people who will fund you, again, short-term mentality, short-term thinking, want the product to market quickly. And within about three to five years, you sell your company off to a larger corporation, and then you move on to something else. Which is essentially a process by which industry outsources its innovation needs to startups. You let the biggest ideas swirl around, you see which ones survive, and you buy those in and incorporate them into your business model. The problem with that I have is that um, the criteria for success when you're a startup is actually not that much what your idea is worth. It is much more, are you able to bring it to market and to make a company out of it? You often hear that only about 10% of startups are successful past the first year. I don't think that means that 90% of startups have a bad idea, quite the opposite. I think that the, the process and the criteria by which a startup is successful is the wrong metric for some of these ideas. If those ideas had been come up with in a completely funded R&D department or a university uh, or a, a, a mindset by which the, the sheer business viability isn't the main criteria, then that idea could have thrived if it was pulled into something like on the industry side, um, an existing process. There's an argument to be made that the current way, the current short-term way of thinking about startups is actually stifling more ideas than it's bringing to the market. Um, players who've come and filled this brain drain vacuum is what I call the gaffers, the Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and, and the like. Um, these are es essentially synonymous with innovation this day. If you think about the most innovative companies, it's always Google or Apple. And what they really are is the startups of 20 years ago that were fueled to absolute market dominance by the financial sector itself as well. What you're seeing, though, in more recent history is that there is a misunderstanding about what the actual purpose of GAFAs is. It's very much driven towards innovation, but there is a very, very existing financial requirement on the side. They need to be profitable, and they need to be profitable in the short term. And we're just starting now to ask very society-wide questions about the roles that these companies have in our lives and whether or not we're comfortable with them. Add to that the fact that they have more and more started to act like industries themselves. 
You hear every quarter roundabouts that um, another major tech player has bought another company for billions of dollars. What that is, is the same as industry. It's innovation by acquisition. It's no longer innovation by in-house nurturing of ideas. And that is essentially what these GAFAs have become. The third player is our 40% from earlier. It's the consultants and the financial sectors and the bankers. Now, I personally, when I was here in Imperial as well, I had the same pitch by the consultants. They come to you and they're so impressed by your background. There was always one issue with the, with the pitch for me. It was the fact that they don't necessarily care what degree you took. They care that it's math-y or technically or engineering-y and that you've got good grades at it, you came to a good school. But then, that's all they really care about. The specifics of it, the specifics of it don't really matter. They just want to take you and again format you in a consultant mindset and put you in a pool of lots of other people that have lots of other skills but they don't really are not that necessary for the consulting world. And then they want to train you to do one thing, which is to give tips to other people. You essentially propose solutions to engineering companies, technical companies, who again, because they're focused on their business model, don't really have their own departments to think about other solutions around the market, so they ask consultants to do that. But the consultant will not be part of the process by which you pick an idea, or you make a decision on which idea to go for and to what extent. Similarly, for the banking side and the investment side, um, they are not the ones who come up with the original idea. They are the ones who will evaluate whether your idea is good at it, take about half your equity for it, and then help you push it through. These are support structures for the idea, but they're not the actual innovation behind it. I think all three of these um, vacuum-seeking players are actually not really an engineering mindset or a technical problem-solving mindset at all. My issue with this is that there are substantial challenges out in the world today that go beyond the digital space and the financial space. The, the, the simple fact that we don't seem to be getting anywhere with climate change is simply because we do need people to go on the ground with real on-site experience to make those changes. Scientists, engineers have that mindset. The same goes for larger issues. Putting a house over, uh, in every, everyone can live in, feeding a population of 9 billion people, and the, the logistics of moving around, the scarcity of water, all these challenges are going to require on-the-ground people and a much more long-term thinking than something that's below five years. And so this model by which industry and it, all the players in it are feeding a short-term mentality model. The only speck of hope that there is out there is the people like you in this room here today. Those who have started out in the process by doing a degree because you're actually interested in what you're studying. You're doing it because you believe in the purpose of it goes back to what we heard a little bit earlier this morning. What is actually driving you? Is it just making sure you follow the process in the company? Or is it more a meaningfulness behind what you do? There's two major changes that need to happen, one for each side of the problem. The first one is obviously on the company side. The companies have to understand that um, they are shying away from their more long-term societal responsibility and their societal role. Um, and it, it's not just giving people more time in the week to go and, and come up with ideas and and in create intrapreneurship labs where you create innovation in-house. It is allowing a technical mindset to come back into the equation, where performance is not measured against the procedure, but it's measured by how innovative you are and how free your engineers are to actually innovate. That is one of the key ways you can keep people within the companies. There's some other ways as well. You can coach young graduates, young engineers, and have them explore other fields. The concept of Thinking in departments or thinking in silos is really has to go away, and pluridisciplinarity is a little bit scary for the people who have been feeding this business model because they're so used to that. But it is one of the ways where you can get inspired by a talk you've seen or someone else's industry and actually bring a that solution into a more long-term side. But there is also another call to audacity, another be bold requirement, which is you guys in this room. There is a real need to bring this purpose of industry, of the engineering mindset, of the fact that you're not just interested in finding a solution to a problem, but actually testing it, seeing if it works, and then if it doesn't work, at least you try it, and then tweaking it and making it work. And that means that we need young people like you guys and the good friends you might have with beginnings of their careers to actually go into the industry and stick it out for a little bit. Now, I'm speaking from experience, it is difficult at the beginning, um, it can be frustrating. You're, you're met with a, a very large reticence to change. But it is essential that it happens because once our generation is the one in the industry, if it's a model we don't believe in, there won't be anyone there. 
but in a, an economy and a, a society without the drive and the long-term thinking potential of industry is one that is, I believe, the longest one. So I would call on all of you to look at industry not with the short-term thinking of, am I going to be happy tomorrow, but one of a more long-term, can I bring in an impact that goes beyond um, just the day-to-day -day life that brings this desire for actual day-to-day -day problem solving into reality and can I actually help our society to return to a long-term thinking.